and welcome again, and uh, thanks for your interest in finite sections. Um, I'm Fabian Gahl from TU Hamburg, and um, I will be presenting some joint work I did together with my colleagues, Dennis Janaun, Julian Grossmann, Marco Lindner, and Rico Kena, all from TU Hamburg. So it's a big team, uh, everyone has his uh, strengths, and um, yeah, we did some nice mathematics that I want to show you a glimpse of today. Um, what is the example that I want you to think about, or the example of today's talk, is um, a discrete Schrödinger operator. Yeah. So, um, we, we also call it H for Hamiltonian, and it's a direct sum, or uh, sorry, it's a sum of uh, discretized Laplacian and some potential V. So we can um, already see the discrete setting, so we are working on uh, a P space of sequences, and uh, our operator can be described pointwise with this uh, three term recursion. All right? Um, I want you to think about this uh, operator as, uh, his, uh, as identified with its uh, matrix representation. How will this matrix representation look like? So, um, should be shouldn't be too difficult. So we have uh, our potential um, v on the diagonal. And we have um, on the upper and the lower diagonal, we have just one. Find my matrix, and the ones they come from the discrete Laplacian, and the v comes from our potential. So, this is the operator example that we want to study today, and we want to study um, the equations that we can solve uh, of the form hx equals y. Uh, it's a classical question given an operator and the right hand side y. Um, can I find an x to solve this equation? So, and one idea um, that uh, the finite section method incorporates is the idea of truncation. Um, means uh, solving uh, an uh, infinite uh, dimensional problem by means of approximation. Um, think of a computer, the computer can only handle finite dimensions, but we are lucky we have uh, at least a countably finite problem. So what one what could think about in terms of the computer algorithm would be, well, what about if I start out with a finite dimensional problem and increase dimension step by step? So this is the idea of this truncation strategy. So we start out with, well, let's take a one by one matrix and look at the corresponding projected um, system of equations. Yeah? And then it would be just a one dimensional system. It, I, it may not be even solvable. Yeah, and then we increase our dimension by looking at larger and larger sections or finite sections of our infinite matrix. And um, yeah, so then we can just pray that this works. So we can um, ask ourselves, well, is our problem at least well posed? So is our original operator invertible? I think this is very natural to assume if, if we want to solve this. If we already know it's not invertible, so what? Um, what can an algorithm produce out of this? Uh, so it may just uh, be rubbish. Um, but then we have this increasing sequence of matrices, and if we want to approximate something, then also these uh, um, approximates should be invertible at some point in time. And of course, they should approximate the inverse of our original operator strongly. In terms of an algorithm, what would this mean? Um, where we solve finite dimensional problems and uh, this generates us a sequence of solutions and we want this sequence of solutions to converge to the solution of the original system. If this is the case, um, then we call the finite section method applicable to our operator. And if you have already guessed, so this, this talk will be about an applicability analysis of this um, truncation method to a certain class of operators, which is uh, given by uh, uh, the periodic Schrödinger operators. Periodic means, in our case, that our potential is uh, k periodic, for k being a natural number. Um, this means, well, I have this uh, sequence v0 to vk 
periodically repeated along the diagonal. How can we motivate the, the study of periodic Schrödinger operators? It's already a very, very well studied topic. And what got us into this study was actually um, the question uh, about the same applicability but for aperiodic um, Schrödinger operators. Let me motivate quickly what the, um, or tell you what an aperiodic Schrödinger operator looks like. Well, in principle, it's from the same form. It's a discrete Schrödinger operator, but the potential now is not given by a sequence of um, periodic numbers, but um, of like a um, well, it's like a, a zero uh, one encoding of a path around the circle. So um, we start off with an offset theta. And then for each step in our sequence, we, um, we rotate our point along uh, an alpha portion of 360 degrees. And you can imagine we start out here, then we jump, out, uh, jump to the next point, and we just go in circles. Depending on the value of alpha, um, interesting things can happen. Namely, if alpha is a rational number, then we will visit the same number of points over and over again after a certain period. But if alpha is not a rational number, this won't happen. In fact, the trajectory of points will lay dense in the whole uh, unit interval or um, we can approximate the whole contour of the circle with the points that we have here. And if this is the case, then we say um, our potential is a uh, Sturmian potential, we have an aperiodic operator, um, and uh, the potential is just of this form. So, find a check section method or approximation of these aperiodic operators um, can be uh, traced back or um, motivated by another truncation technique that comes from number theory, namely continued fraction expansion. For every Irrational number, we have a continued fraction expansion that looks like this. Yeah, that's an infinite fraction, it does not end. If we stop this uh, sequence at a certain point, then we get a rational number, and this is what we call um, a rational approximate to this irrational number. So, this is the truncation. We truncate this infin uh, infinite sequence, um, and we get a rational number. In terms of our Schrödinger operator, this um, is easy to understand what this means. This means we take our potential and approximate it by periodic potentials, by plugging in not the alpha that was irrational, but um, well, the nth periodic approximation. So we approximate our Schrödinger potential by periodic potentials. And in, in case of this uh, matrix representation, this means we operate, uh, we approximate our end periodic Schrödinger operator by periodic ones. So this truncation technique from number theory gives us an approximation method for uh, aperiodic Schrödinger operators, and this also translates into spectra. And this is what we are interested in when we talk about the finite section method. Um, we want to study invertibility of one operator. And we have now an approximation method that involves easier operators, the periodic ones, and we can also tell something about the spectrum uh, if we know something about the spectrum of the approximates. So this, um, if this looks odd to you, this is something like a um, topological Lima superior of sets. Yeah, sometimes the Lima superior does, does not come with the closure, but in terms of our um, numerical analysis, uh, this is nothing else than um, the set of all points uh, of the real numbers, just like a spectrum, but um, for this operator sequence to be stable. That means that the finite section method is applicable. So, we have now our eyes on this um, periodic Schrödinger operators and we want to study their spectrum. We need to understand their spectrum. How um, do we do this? So, um, if we have a periodic Schrödinger operator, um, the spectrum is just a point spectrum. So, we can explicitly write down a sequence for each eigenvector 
that um, co could correspond to one eigenvalue in the spectrum. So this is just a three, three time recursion that I get when I subtract just the diagonal with ease from my matrix representation here. This can also be uh, rewritten um, in a different way by using matrix multiplication, which makes it also easy to implement on a computer. So in the end, um, what we do is we have just have a two by two matrix multiply it with a subsection of our input vector and we get another subsection like a shifted by one unit. We call these matrices transfer matrices and if we have a periodic potential, this means um, we only have a finite number of transfer matrices, namely k1 if our uh, k transfer matrices if our operator is k periodic. So, how can we describe our spectrum of H with transfer matrices? Um, for this, we, we need to um, define a new matrix that is just a product of all our transfer matrices. And then, um, Floquet block theory and uh, the trace map formalism gives us already uh, a very nice result in order to check whether a real number lies inside the spectrum or not. Maybe for a, a periodic Schrödinger operator, um, an energy lies in the spectrum if and only if the absolute value of the trace of the monotony matrix is less or equal than 2. So it's time for some pictures. If we have now this trace map formalism, this trace mapping, um, so this is just a finite matrix, a 2 by 2 matrix, I can calculate traces, I can calculate uh, zeros or uh, at least uh, the zeros of trace minus 2 and trace plus 2 in order to determine the spectral bands of my periodic operator. And um, if I do this, for this type of potentials that we, um, that we consider that come from the uh, periodic approximation, namely um, potentials that just have ones and zeros but are multiplied with a scaling factor lambda, um, we get, well, for each lambda we get a set of bands and the number of bands, or the number of spectral bands, corresponds to the period that we have. So, if we talk about invertibility, um, we don't need a picture that big. But uh, I think it plays out nicely if you call it seaweed, then, uh, then you can see what I mean. But for the, the numerical analysis, the only thing we need to worry about is this straight line at the energy zero, because this one encodes whether our operator is invertible. Or not. So for the two-sided operator, we have already a very nice criterion to check whether it's invertible or not, just by calculating the trace. So now the um, finite section method doesn't only need the invertibility of one operator, but we also need to know something about the, the sequence of approximates that we have here. And one of the core ideas is um, that we uh, but that we check the invertibility of our, um, or the, the stability of our approximating sequence by looking at something that one can think about uh, like running along this diagonal and looking what operators I get um, out if I take subsequences of the natural number sequence uh, that runs from zero to infinity. What can happen with an operator if I start out with a sequence that just goes to infinity and then I consider this, uh, this shift of diagonals and I just run along that diagonal. So what, what can be the limit of, uh, of this process? And um, well, if the sequence converges, we call the resulting operator a limit operator. And for periodic Schrodinger operators, these limit operators are Easy found, easily found. They are just, for a k periodic one, they are just k different operators that one can get. If we run along the diagonal, um, we just have a, a finite number here of different values that we can reach. So our sequences need to get constant at one point. So the um, resulting operator will also be a periodic Schrödinger operator with the same period, but with a potential that is um, a cyclic permutation of the original one. Um, and well, 
for for k values uh, or for a sequence of length k, we have uh, exactly k different cyclic permutations, including the identity. And then this is just the set of limit operators that we have. For aperiodic Schrödinger operators, this set is much bigger. So um, we are really lucky to have just a small set to handle. And um, for technical reasons, we um, also need to introduce um, an, another operator that is just like our original Schrödinger operator, but with a reverse potential. In which sense do you think you're doing it? Ah, so this is a, is a strong limit. So uh, in the sense of this matrix, this means like we just fix one point and run along the diagonal, so point-wise or entry-wise in the matrix sense, or um, strongly in uh, the sense of uh, elements of our vector space. Yeah. Yeah, but th I think I think it's uh, it's good to think about uh, if we have a matrix A three A J. Then I just, uh, how is the sequence called? HK. So I just add the HKs here. This means I just start out here and then I run along the diagonal in one direction. And so if we're already uh, talking about the sequence, so these reverse operators or these reverse operators are needed because in the finite section method, I not only need to consider sequences that run to plus infinity, but also to minus infinity. But in the case of periodic Schrödinger operators, um, yeah, one can do a little trick to make it the notation a bit easier to just run in one direction. So now we have these operators, these limit operators, but we are still looking for a, a theorem that can help us to prove applicability of the finite section method. And I'm, so I'm just making some commercial for limit operators. Let me tell you uh, why we need them. So if we have now uh, our Schrödinger operators and the Schrödinger oper uh, operator HR with the reverse potential, what we now look at for the finite section method, or what we also need to consider, are um, one-sided compressions. So in the matrix sense, this is very easy. So if we have H, then the, this blue, uh, sorry, this green section, or you can read this, it corresponds to this um, plus compression, uh, one-sided compression of our Schrödinger operator. And now uh, I call this a lemma because it's for us uh, this is um, yeah, this is just the, the, the tool that we use. But um, so the, the state of the art of this technique uh, uh, is much more involved that I can present here. So I'm listing some uh, of the names that are yeah currently at the frontier of what is possible to do with the finite section method and um, yeah, this approximation method. And so, summing up what, what it tells us, so I promised you a result on, um, on the applicability. So it tells us we have applicability If the following holds, so um, our operator H needs to be invertible, so this is not, not new. Um, but now we also need to look at um, these positive compressions, these one sided compressions. So it's uh, their spectrum in some sense, and do this for all limit operators of H. And HR. Okay, so and then we have the following theorem. So the FSM is applicable if and only if zero, yeah, this is the only straight line that we need to look at in our seaweed plots. If zero is not an element of the spectrum of H or of uh, the spectrum of one of the one sided uh, compressions of limit operators. And um, it gets a little bit easier. Um, if we also know that, um, in fact, what, what these points can add are just discrete, uh, discrete points to the set. So, now, we talk about these half-line compressions or one-sided Schrödinger operators because this is the thing that we cannot control yet. What we can control is the spectrum of H via our trace, the trace of M. Uh, the monotony matrix. 
So this is also summarized here again. So we have under control the spectrum of H. And um, oh, there's a type on here, it should be less or equal than 2. Um, and we have now this, uh, this monotony matrix that uh, well, has four entries. And I can already tell you, so for the spectrum of the one-sided operator, we will take to, uh, have to look at the entries of this matrix. And um, so this is by Raphael Hacker, so he wrote this in his PhD thesis, and we well, somehow find it, found it again. Uh, there's a nice criterion that really just boils down to checking the entries of the monotropy matrix uh, in order to decide whether a point lies inside the discrete spectrum of a one-sided operator or not. Ah, and then we will just have to check this lower entry uh, to be zero and the upper entry to be less or equal than one. So you can think about this as uh, this value here corresponding to the uh, to one eigenvalue that is uh, less than one, which uh, leads to our sequence in the kernel to be bounded, and this is then uh, something that um, we do not want. So, so the corollary then here is for, for our uh, studies that um, if we have that the trace is greater than two, meaning that our operator is invertible. Then we have a, a, an equivalence between the invertibility of our one-sided operator and while well, checking the entries of our monotony matrix. In fact, um, yeah, we can also negate the statement so the operator is not invertible, this one side, if uh, the entry is 0, m21, and m11 is less than 1. So back to our CV plot. Now we can add the spectrum of the one-sided operator. We get two lines, yeah. And um, so let me now tell you in the last few minutes how we studied these potentials algorithmically. Because um, yeah, we, we somehow wanted to get a statement about uh, what is possible for these operators. So what we did is. Let's see if I can fix the algorithm in here. We uh, wanted to fix a period k, and then for each um, period, we want to take a look at uh, at all uh, so at all words that I can construct consisting of zeros and lambda of length k. Yeah? So I did this do this here parallelly for a three-dimensional. Uh, example or three-dimensional uh, work here. So then in the next step, what I calculate is the monotony matrix. And what you can see here is, well, it's rather obvious, the entries of the monotony matrix uh, will once again be polynomials in lambda. So then what we need to take a look at is the zeros uh, of the entry 2-1. So what we define uh, is just the set uh, sigma of all energies, uh, no, sorry, of all, of all lambdas, where um, the monotony matrix is zero. Then we evaluate the trace at this point in order um, yeah, to get to our final check whether um, the trace of m um, at this for this value of lambda is uh, yeah greater than two or not. I'm already out of time, but the idea is to mutually exclude the case that I have a zero in uh, this lower left entry and um, well an invertible two-sided operator to get also a nice criterion for operators. Uh, for periodic, uh, one-sided periodic Schrödinger operators to be invertible, and so we can see this. This won't happen in the in the case of length four. Um, for uh, periodic operators with length uh, with period five, um, this will happen if lambda has a value of one over square root over two. So here we have a case of a one-dimensional operator of a Schrödinger operator that is not invertible with a potential that takes real values, 
in the uh, case of a nine periodic example, we also find a scaling factor that is rational that intro introduces this um, and not invertible one sided operator. And so, take home messages for you are we now can prove with this algorithm um, that we also carry out with the computer that for periods large as smaller than four, all potentials. Um, lead to an applicable finance action method, or potentials of these zero lambda that we form. And if the um, period is smaller than eight, then um, this still holds if the scaling factor is rational. So we characterize the trace with uh, yeah. the trace of m used to characterize applicability. This is what we that we want, just one easy criterion to check applicability. And um, yeah, hopefully you also saw some applications of why it's interesting to look at one-sided um, trade operations. Yeah, thank you very much.